I want to talk about what we find at the cross today. Today is Palm Sunday, and, and everything that happens this week, I want us to focus on and be intentional about. What, what, what does Jesus going to Calvary mean to us? What does it mean to our families and our lives? And I hope, I pray, that the cross still fires you up. Amen? I hope that there's still a passion that there's still a connection, that it's not just a, a wall art, that it's not just a necklace where you got, you got a cross on my tongue, a cross on my nose, and a cross on my tongue, and you got a cross around my neck, and you got crosses everywhere. You got a lot of religion, but you got no relationship. I, I, I hope that, you know, it, it doesn't just get to that, that we understand that it has truly transformed our lives, and we're still deeply connected to what Jesus did on the cross. If you got your Bibles or your phones or your tablets or the free Bible on screen, we're going to go to Luke 23, 26. I just want to read you an encounter. I'm not going to keep you long today. I want to read you an encounter. It says, as the soldiers led him away, they see Simon from uh, Siren, uh, who was on his way from the country, from Siren, on the way from the country. And he put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now a number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals and on his right, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not what they are doing. Isn't it amazing on one of his most grueling days, his focus was not on his pain, but on his purpose. And they divided up his clothes by casting lot. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hung there hurled insults at him and says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. But the other criminal rebuked him. He says, don't you fear God? He said, since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him and said, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that good news? It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. And the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So many eyes watching that day. So many different eyes, including all the eyes of heaven. The eyes of two thieves. The eyes of Roman guards. The eyes of the critics. The eyes of a mother. The eyes of a best friend. The eyes of the disciples. It's interesting to me that while this is taking place, there's also different responses that are taking place at the same time. Some are aware of what is happening. Soldiers at the foot of the cross are rolling dice, gambling for his clothes. Some were, some sympathized, some criticized. Some were focused, Jesus' mother and John. Some were just off, just clueless to what was happening. They didn't even know what was going on in the city that day. Many of the movies that we've seen, including The Passion of, of the Christ, it's an amazing film, but it didn't even show that as Jesus left the praetorium with the guards to go to Calvary, that's about a mile's distance, and I've been blessed enough to see that for myself. Uh, in fact, I'm, we're taking a team three days after Easter, back to Israel, so y'all be in prayer for us. But it's about a mile's distance, and the Romans would always make 
uh, the, the, those who were cynics go the longest and the hardest way to make a spectacle. There was a parade of people watching. Josephus, who was a historian, he writes in one of his accounts that there were over 3 million people that gathered the streets to watch this crucifixion. It's amazing to me that people could be at the same event, see the same thing, and respond so differently. It's often the same way when you see somebody have a car wreck. People are on looking. One person saw it this way. One person saw it this way. One person saw it that way. Same wreck, three different views. Am I making sense to everybody? Now, I, this might surprise you because you all know how educated and how eloquent I am. <laughs> what a hateful church. I, can, I do not have a Ph.D., but I have a PWD, which is much more valuable. It's a people watching degree. <laughs> Don't act like y'all ain't got one. I love watching people. I love how people can be in the same room watching the same thing and have totally different responses. You can have two people pe- in a room watching a football game. Somebody scores a touchdown. One side of the room is woo! The other side of the room, man, that's stupid. That right there, that's stupid right there. They're throwing the remote and they ain't eating, they ain't talking to you no more. It's usually the Longhorns when the Red Raiders beat them. Um, <laughs> those kind of people. For the word has says the horns of the wicked shall be cut off. <laughs> Root those Red Raiders on today. Somebody, somebody falls. And, and, and there's evil, mean people. Some will laugh. You ever seen somebody fall and somebody bust out laughing? They're called Pastor Trish. <laughs> Jocelyn, the keyboard player. Sherry Stabler. Mean people. Some people will run for help. Uh uh-uh. uh. Will run to help. Some people will run. For for help, and some run because there ain't no help. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but, but I'm a people watcher, and me and my dad, we would love to watch people. We would, great, this is terrible, get some of our greatest joys just watching people. People respond differently. And it's interesting to me that on this Friday, with so many people watching, there were some that were focused on what Jesus was doing. There were those that were committed to it. There were those there that were non-committed. There were those who said some things, but when it came down to the cross, they changed the things that they said. There were those who were looking to it, looking at Jesus that were broken in their hearts because of what was happening. There were those who didn't understand what was happening. Some were confused, all watching the same event with different views and different emotions. And there's never... There's never been another event, not another single six-hour event. It was the greatest event in mankind. There has never been another event that meant more to mankind at any time in history than this six hours that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, paid the price so that you and I could be here today. There's never been another time. It changed everything. That weekend changed everything. Everything with death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus and Savior. It's a game changer. You talk about God, nobody gets upset. You talk about Muhammad, nobody gets upset. You talk about Hammurabi, nobody gets upset. You talk about the name of Jesus, they try to take him out of school. They try to take him out of our mouths. Come on. He's a game changer. It's amazing to me. Jesus, people. You go up to him and you're like, hey, you met Jesus? Oh, shoot, you know. (laughs) It's a game changer, man. That name is a game changer. The greatest event in history. And people are there watching it. And yet they're still so unaware. There are people thousands of years later that are still so unaware of what that event truly meant. Come on, somebody. You break down that event It's God's son on a cross. It's a public execution. Hanging on a cross, not for his sin, but ours. It's a horrible death. He's dying, but we get to live. He's guilty so we can be free. Come on, somebody. 
thieves saying to him, save yourself. And Jesus fully knowing that it's impossible for him to save himself and to save us. And so therefore he stands on the cross. No wonder they call him savior this morning. I think that as we walk in on Palm Sunday and this week, I want to be fully aware of what the last week of Jesus' life meant. I don't want to get distracted this week. I don't want to be what the Bible called just an onlooker. I don't want to be someone watching. I want to be someone who enters into the courts of worship of our Savior. I don't want to be known as somebody off in the distance. I want to be fully aware. I want to be fully present. I don't want to be careless. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to be indifferent. I sure do not want to be casual about what Christ has done for me. I want to be fully aware this week of the greatest moment of all time. And I challenge you. To press in this week and be fully aware of what this next week, weekend totally means for you today. Because it has a message for us. When I look at the cross, I believe it has a visible message. It speaks to what Jesus did. I like what it said in Luke 23. It said all kinds of people were there. All kinds of people are candidates to receive his love. Black people, white people. Brown people, red people, sunburn people trying to get ready for summer. <laughs> Poor people, rich people, fat people, skinny people, people that's not fat, just too, too short for the weight. <laughs> Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, I'm an example. I'm an example. All kinds of people. And I'm so glad that the Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. I'm glad it didn't say a name because a whosoever could be anyone. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter what you didn't know. As you encounter him. And all the foot of the cross is level. Come on, somebody. I, I, I like that it said that. I think one of the messages when you look at the cross, it has a vertical message. There's two beams. The vertical message says, I can approach God. That God has made a way. That blesses me. That there was a gulf between man and God and Jesus became the bridge for that gulf. Was it made out of uh, concrete or wood or nails? It was made out of flesh and blood. I, I, I'm thankful that I can enter into access. Do you know if I want to go talk to the janitor at my son's high school, I got to make an appointment. Come on, somebody. If I want to go interview for a job, I have to make an appointment to have an interview to get that job. But Jesus gave us access so that we could go at any time. No matter what I could. I didn't have to get dressed up for the interview. My God. I didn't have to get soaked up, scoped up. I could still be doped up and come into the presence of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't got to make an appointment. Me showing up, that's the appointment. Because can I tell you, whenever show you show up, it wasn't by accident. He was expecting you. Ah, that's good news this morning. Hallelujah. Woo, I feel like preaching. I hope you feel like listening. There's access to God. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. God just did it. And you and I can go based on what he did, not what we've done. You all know you and I going to get far on what you did. You glad you go to a church where we don't testify about what we did. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, don't even ask me about last night, bless God. I, huh? Don't even ask me about my tech basketball party later. It, oh, hello, I'm talking to you. So God came to man and he made a way for me, but he didn't just make a way for me. He made a way for my family. He made a way for my children. He made a way for my friends. I couldn't get to him, so he made a bridge to me. It's vertical and yet it's horizontal. He also made a way for us to have relationships. A way for us to live a fresh way. Made a way for us to find forgiveness in our marriages. New beginnings in our families. That's awesome. I'm glad our, everybody's marriage and worship center is so healthy. For those of us that know that we need a new beginning, everybody in here sometime, whether you know it or not, you may be going to lie about it, just lie about it. But everybody here has sometimes needed a new beginning in their marriage. Amen. People say, I. I don't want one. I, no, I'm just, I, but it makes a way for our families 
It's vertical message and it's horizontal because it gives us access to God. And then we can approach each other and see our life from a different point of view, a different vantage. See, often I tell people about how much my life has changed since I came to Christ. And they can't understand it because they don't have the same view I have. They don't have a vantage point that I have. In the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, up to chapter 4. It says, I'll talk to you about where you've been. I'll talk to you about where you're at. But if you want to know what's going to happen after this, you got to step up higher because you can't see it from where you're at. Go read it for yourself after chapter 4. It says, you got to come up higher. There's some things that you can't see from your vantage point. You can only see it after you receive salvation. Am I making sense to anybody? And so it changes how you even see. He makes all things new. Somebody say all. All things new. Our approach to life and our relationships change when we experience what Jesus did for us on the cross. Because we don't speak to people the way we used to speak to them anymore. We don't view people the way we used to view them anymore. We don't let bitterness and anger and malice and gossip eat us up. Why? Because we bring it to the cross. We experience God's forgiveness. And when you have experienced God's forgiveness, then you can forgive other people. I'm just going to tell you, man, it is hard to stand in front of a bloodstained cross and an empty tomb and refuse to forgive somebody. When you know how sorry you used to be and how sorry we continue to be at times, and yet God always gives us grace. It's amazing to me. Those who experience the love of God can love the unlovable. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that God didn't have to... Listen... I got to get to know people before I can love them. I got to get to know some people before I can love them. Yeah, and then after I meet them, I'm like, I don't love them. (laughs) Am I being real? You ain't never had to pray that prayer like, Lord, I don't like them, but help me love them. (laughs) See, I just say what you won't say because you want everybody to be impressed that you at church, but I'm telling the truth. Lord, help me like them or help me love them because I don't like them right now. You got to pray that prayer. I'm so glad that God didn't have to get to know me. See, he knew me because he formed me. Y'all not ready? He put me together in my mother's womb, and he already knew how sorry I was going to be, but yet he already knew what he had a purpose for me to do at the same time. And so he didn't have to get to love me. He was already just in love. And I want to tell somebody today, God doesn't love you more when you get saved than he loves loves you more uh, uh, before you get saved. He isn't going to love you more tomorrow than he does today. He just loves everybody in his room. And it's hard for us to understand that. That. but he does man and, and, and those who have experienced the miraculous power of God in your life when God heals you and he does a work in your life and he bandages those wounds and he sets you free and he puts your heart back in a new direction and he frees you from addiction and he frees you from the pain of yesterday you know what happens we can then operate in our present healed and whole because of what he did on the cross i just want to remind you of a couple of things today and we'll get up out of here there's as you go through this week i want to remind you of what this place is and what we can have and what can be ours number one the place of the cross is a place that a price was paid jesus paid a price that you couldn't pay There was no way I could save myself. It's impossible. I want to set somebody free right now. It's impossible for you to earn the love of God. It just, he just gives you the love of God. I I could never be good enough to take care of it on my own. So I have to remember that there was a price to pay. I was guilty and sentenced to death, but Jesus came and took my place and paid the price for my sin. Listen, if I should choose him, he doesn't force me. That's that's why his love is so incredible. He doesn't make us love him. But he makes a way for us to get to him if we want to. Are you seeing this? There's other people that may make you pay the price for their love. They manipulate you to get you to love them. They say things. For you to, if you love me, you'll do this. If you love me, you'll do this. Jesus said, I love you this much and I'll do this so you don't have to do anything but believe in me. Yeah. Believe in me. All you have to do is look to him, 
trust in him, commit to him, have relationship with him. You understand that when you look at the cross, religion is all there, everywhere around it, but relationship was nailed to it. I'm not interested in your religion. Well, I'm Baptist. I'm Methodist. I'm Church of Christ. I'm Catholic. I'm this. You know, I... Long before we had all that, you know what we was called? Believers. Just believers. If we would focus on the one thing we have in common, I guarantee a lot more people would be running to the cross instead of running from the cross. Well, Pastor Todd, it's important. We sprinkle and we dunk. We speak in tongues. We don't speak in tongues. We have elders. We have deacons. We have guitars. We have no guitars. You have exhausted me already. (laughs) Jesus found Philip. Philip found Nathaniel. There was no theology class. There was no discussion over instruments. There was no discussion over baptized, dunk, sprinkle. There There was no, you know what he said? Come see. Come see and taste and see that the Lord is good. And it won't matter if you got a banjo or a washboard or some spoons or a drum. It won't matter if you got to put water to make the sign or you got a cross on the wall. It won't matter because what will change you is the blood of Jesus Christ. It amazes me. The world knows more about what the church is against than what we're for. I am for people loving people. I am for people making barbecue and inviting me. I'm for watermelon. And I am for the Texas. No, I listen. I'm for redemption. I'm not only for second chances. I'm for hundredth chances. I'm for a million chances. I'm for whatever it takes chances. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? That's what the cross has provided. It's not a religion. It's a relationship this morning. It's a place where choices are made. Nobody is neutral at Calvary. Everybody's making choices. Everyone is making decisions. Some say yes, some say no. What Jesus did on the cross makes a decision. Those two thieves had a decision. One said yes, one said no. And when Jesus came into paradise, there was one thief that came walking in him with him. Now, check this out. This is awesome. This dude had done so many things run wrong, but he did one thing right. He got crucified next to the right person. Come on. That's a good day. That's a bad day turned good. Come on, somebody. That's a good. Are you here? You think this is the end. And Jesus said, this is only the beginning. Hallelujah. You thought that was going to kill you. Jesus said, this is going to make you. I'm not talking about time. I'm talking about forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And when we get through with that, forever and ever and ever. And ever. Somebody give God a good shout of praise, man. I'm having so much fun today. It's a place of new beginnings. That sounds good in a marriage. Sometimes you need a fresh start with your kids. Sometimes it's been a stale, a little murky. We get too busy. We just need a fresh start. A reset button for everyone. It's a place of hope for the future. There are people everywhere that have no hope for the future. Man, I'll tell you, one of the toughest things that you'll ever go through is once you lose hope. You ever lose hope, you're defeated. But you can find hope in what he did for you on the cross. Find hope that those words, I'll never leave you or forsake you, actually mean something. I've had people in this world tell me they would never leave me or never forsake me, only to look back and no one was there. Even Peter, I'll never deny you. Anybody seen Peter? Nope. <laughs> Peter done gone ghost. Huh? He like Osama bin Laden, the king, king of hide and go seek. Come on, somebody. Y'all catch that on the way home. That fool's the king of hide and go seek. But the Marines found him. Anyway, so (laughs) people say they'll never leave you or walk out on you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. It's a place of healing. I've seen that in my own life. The healing power of Jesus. And it's not always physically. Now, I was blessed enough. I'm going to use a word here that'll freak people out because you got to know what the whole word means before you get freaked out. But I grew up in church. I grew up in something called Pentecost. When you say Pentecost, people, ah, you're those people that have snakes and live chickens. 
We had chicken, but it was from churches. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're getting chicken from KFC, you've already gone against God. When the chicken place is called churches, <laughs> you go down there today and you get your glory box. Come on, somebody. You bite it. It's not good chicken unless you bite it and that grease gets on and ruins one of your shirts. Ha! <laughs> and then you know what you do? Then you get your honey butter biscuit and you eat that. Then when you get full, then you go to KFC and you get one of their parfaits. Come on, somebody. <laughs> oh, I didn't get this big by not knowing where to go. I'm going to tell you that right now. But I, but I grew up in Pentecost, man. I've seen eyes open. I've seen legs grow. I seen the lame walk. People say, you didn't see that? Yes, 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 I did. I, I saw it. I saw it. But still, people are here all the time, man, I would love to see one of those miracles. Can I tell you, in early service, we saw one of the greatest miracles, how eight people who were dead got moved to life. See, y'all want to see eyes grow and legs be open, and I'm all for that too, but I got to see a dead man walk today. Ah, hallelujah. I got to see a dead woman come in here one way and leave better than the way. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? There's, there's healing at that thing. It's, it's a place of freedom. Your mess up, your bondage, your, I can't believe I did this again. I can't believe I'm here again. And, and the shadow of what he did for us, he gives us hope. He heals our marriages. He heals our mess up. He heals our brokenness. He bought us a new beginning. He reached me when nobody else could. He reached me when nobody else would. He walked in when everybody else was walking out. What were they looking for on that day? Did they, they think they would see somebody weak? Did they see, did they think they would see some punk up on a cross? Can I tell you, my Jesus ain't got no punk in him. Yeah. Did they think they would see something defeated? I want to tell you something, church. What they saw was not a battlefield. It was a battleground <laughs> where God Almighty Fought and gave his son and spilled out his blood so that you can have relationship. You need power this morning. There's power at the cross. You need might this morning. There is might at the cross. You need redemption. There is redemption at the cross. You need forgiveness. There's forgiveness at the cross. You need a new beginning. There's a new beginning at the cross. You need a do-over. There's a do-over at the cross. It's, it's in the grip of God that he reaches down and he says, you're never alone. Because there's a calm that covers me when I kneel down at his feet. And it's my place of freedom. See, all of us, whether you know it or not, need that cross have to have that cross because on the cross is where the price was paid the evidence of that is an empty tomb so today hear me we're going to celebrate a cross but next week Isn't there? He's like Ray Stevens said, he's everywhere, he's everywhere. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but at that cross, there's a do-over. I was fortunate enough, I said a while ago I was raised in Pentecost, I was raised in church. Church wasn't raised in me. My dad was a deacon. It's always the deacon's kids that reach that ruin the pastor's kids. I know that now as a pastor. But as a deacon's kid, I did my job well. <laughs> Some of the stuff I say is funny. Only to me, bro. <clears throat> my mom was a youth pastor and I was a crud, man. Got called to preach when I was 13 and ran as fast as I could. You know what stinks? <laughs> when you're a sinner... You ever thought about what, when you're a sinner, it, is, it stinks 
to out, try to outrun somebody that's omnipresent. And I heard you look at me like, well, Pastor, you're not that fast in the first place. <laughs> first off, you're a judger. <laughs> you know what the Bible says about that? <laughs> Number two, I've got cat like reflexes. <laughs> Ninja skills. And it depends on what you're having at the table as to how fast I can get there or not. <laughs> but it stinks, man, to... to to try to run from somebody who's already there when you get there. And so many times it made me so mad that I would get from here to there and he would be there. And I thought, dude, I am trying to out, leave me alone. And I'd run over here and he'd already be there. And I would say, I don't understand. What part? Where are we losing each other in communication, Jesus? I don't want you here. I don't want you to be here. And I knew he heard me, but he didn't move. And what I come to realize is I needed him more here than I ever did over there. And that there was nothing I could say that would keep him from being there when I got there. And there was nothing I could do to keep him from loving me. <laughs> 